dirty wigs, paper dresses, and macaroni. If you thought parachute pants were weird, buckle up. Welcome back to Bumblebee. Here are the top 10 unusual ways that people in history dressed. No offense if you're a thousand years old. Let's do it. Kicking off the list at number 10, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, here we go. Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Watshaw Longfellow, Longfellow, great last name, really love that. His wife, Fanny, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that she sadly didn't survive. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is. And the fact that candles were used everywhere obviously didn't help. You're a walking ball of cotton and some of these dresses were six feet wide cages, literally, I'll get into that later on. But arsenic dresses were on a whole new level of deadly, even without the candles, this dress could already just kill you. Arsenic was used back then to get that green look. Real arsenic was used. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and ended up dying a horrible, horrible way. Her fingernails had turned green, green foam was coming out of their mouth, the whites of her eyes had turned green. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Yeah, the 1800s were a wild time. And believe me, it only gets weirder from here. Number nine, the hobble skirt. Here we go, we're gonna slowly walk like penguins for this one. Just from this 1910 headline alone, the hobble skirt sounds like a good time. The June 12 headline reads, the hobble is the latest freak in women fashion. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Doesn't that pull you in? I want one already, let's do it, let's. French designer Paul Poiret made these to free the bust while shackling the legs. Just what you need to move around on uneven stone roads back hundreds of years ago. We love it. Love the practicality of the outfit. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and is, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons like losers. Ha, what are you, walking? So they could actually walk around, you know? What a weird thing to do. These hobble skirts were worn by the, you know, the fancy and they were like, Mm, we don't walk, we're too fancy for that. We'll just stand in one place and do this a lot. And also this, I guess. I don't know what this is. These hobble skirts were so popular at the time that upper class folks sought out a new fashion trend that made them look even fancier than the rest. So they just did it for clout. And they look stupid. I'll say, they look kind of stupid. Number eight, macaroni. This one's extra cheesy. Macaroni joke, we got it. Back in the mid 1700s, aristocratic British men would wear these large wigs, and I mean large, large wigs. These things were comedically big, but what would make them so unique was the tiny little hat on top of this massive wig. Or it was a feather, a feather or a little hat. A little Monopoly sized piece hat, just right on top of this. The Yankee Doodle Rhyme mentions this macaroni, that's the macaroni they're referring to. Stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. He called it KD Mac and Cheese. These British men were inspired after traveling across Europe and it's named after macaroni like the pasta because it signifies sophistication and worldliness. Every time I eat KD I'll be like sophistication, sophisticatedication. That was the whole point of the rhyme that any average Joe can just put a old feather in their hair and then be as valuable as macaroni. You can be macaroni guys, you can do it. Hit that thumbs up and then we'll all be macaroni. Number seven, the hoop skirt. The hoop skirt is way too much. I mean, for starters, it looks like something you would find on a playground. Children can for sure do chin ups on the hoop skirt. These skirts were six foot wide, like hoops, they were the talk of the town. Would have been perfect for the pandemic, actually, six by six, nice. They were the talk of the town around the 1700s and it was often handmade from whalebone or basket willow. And if you attended King Louis XVI's court, it might as well be a packed bar. You're sneaking by everybody, these small passageways between people and their now six foot hoop radius skirts. It's not, not practical at all, but they did look fancy. Later on in the mid 1800s, a newer version of the skirt came out and these were better because they were made of steel. I'm not joking. This was considered new and or improved. They could produce these more often now being made of steel. So this was really the first time in history where your legs could also actually move around while you looked good. We went from hobble skirts to cage skirts. I think we're getting better. I think maybe. Number six, paper dresses. Okay, we're not getting better at all. Moving on to some modern fashion trends, this short-lived fad was introduced in the 1960s. Paper dresses. Yes, it's as ridiculous as it sounds. Paper dresses to go-go. Just don't spill anything at all or make any sudden movements and you're good. 
You ever played Paper Mario? You're basically cosplaying Paper Mario. The Scott Paper Company made these, not expecting the reaction that it got. It caught on quick, of course. Fidget spinners were only four years ago, so if you want to talk about paper dresses, open that cupboard and check yourself before you wreck yourself. It only took six months for this casual paper company to start selling more than half a million paper dresses. They couldn't even keep up with this work. It went so well that other companies hopped on board and they too began making these paper dresses. It was just everywhere. Over $3 million were spent on this fad. Andy Warhol was even in on the mix at one point. It was a big deal. They weren't made of flimsy printer paper either. It wasn't as bad as I'm making it sound, but it certainly wasn't good either. The dress was made of a disposable material called DuraWeave. Believe it or not, slightly water and slightly fire resistant. Unlike those puffy middle-aged dresses, it was a bit better. It's been compared to the thick paper bit that you get when you're at the dentist, that flimsy material that bunches up and then pokes your neck, it has like the weird chain that's not really connected too well, that tiny little clip thing. It's made of that, a whole dress made of that. <laughs> Have fun at prom, don't light on fire. Number five, wax cones. This next one we need to bring back. I'm tired of washing my beanie, it smells you don't want to know, honestly. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. We're going way back for this one. They would sit on top of your head, and back in 2019, we actually found evidence that they were in fact used. Before then, we just saw them on paintings and such. What would happen is men and women would wear this cone, and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone, and the cone itself was made of oils, fats, resins, and it would be placed on their wig or directly on their head to make them smell better as the day went by. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. Number four, crack hose. Today's footwear is pretty comfortable. We have shoes that correct your stride while you take your morning jog. We have Crocs, which, you know, they're just a blessing, you know, just in general, they're great. Crack hose were a style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century in Europe. The thing with these long-toed shoes, they first appeared in the 12th century, and they would come and go over time, as most fashion trends do. But the Krako, this thing was twice as long as your foot. People are tripping over these things left, right, and center. They look ridiculous. Why were they so long? Why did they keep coming back over and over? Named after the city, of course, that they were made in, Krakows were used by both men and women, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the cooler the dude. Yeah, size did matter. These things would be stuffed with horsehair or moss, but the insane part is, is that these things were so long, a string would have to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee, so it was like, you know, had to have the cool curve. You had to have that interesting curve. We need to bring these back immediately. Imagine tying a Krako to your knee before prom, you'd be fired up. You'd be doing like the sea walk in no time. Number three, wigs. Okay, I mentioned the macaroni look, little hat with a big wig, but wigs were such a big deal that they deserve their own point on this list. You see it so often in movies and TV, any plot that takes place in the early 17th century, it's just wigs galore. This all began when Louis XIII of France wore a wig to hide his baldness. Yeah, people love copying royalty. Even when Queen Elizabeth's teeth were black and rotten from eating so many sweets, people copied that look. They made their teeth look rotten because, well, obviously, that's the cool thing. Gross, don't do that, brush your teeth. In the 17th century, syphilis was also to blame. This was a bad time in Europe, of course, long before antibiotics, most things were pretty bad. But the side effects of syphilis include sores and hair loss. What better way to hide the fact that you're losing a bit of hair than to wear a wig nine times as noticeable in public than if you were just to have patchy hair? This is a solution, I guess. It kicked off with Louis XIV at just age 17. He hired 50 wig makers. His cousin, Charles II, he was going gray around the same time, so he too wore a wig, and then everyone thought wigs were cool, and then Bob's your uncle. I'm starting to go gray already. Next time you see me, I'll be wearing a 17th century lice-filled, flammable, stinky wig, because that's better, apparently. Number two, bombasting. The origin of stuffing your bra, let's do it. Mr. Boombastic, is it fantastic after all? What does it even mean to call somebody boombastic? What is this? Well, back in the 16th century, if you looked like a literal couch, you were considered royalty. The bigger the belly, the bigger the arms, the bigger the everything, the better. Size mattered a lot back then. Men and women would stuff cotton, wool, or sawdust. Yeah, they would stuff sawdust in their clothing to appear more muscular, or to seem like they ate a lot. Now it's so funny because while of course this makes sense in history and stuff like I just mentioned, the legs of these guys were always so hmm, tiny. They would more often than not make their arms look ripped and their bellies huge, but they still needed to move around and be like, ah oh, yes, and like, you know, that whole my lady stuff. A guy the size of a minivan isn't intimidating. It looks more uncomfortable than anything. And in case you're wondering, yes, men would usually stuff just one part of their trousers. That's just false advertising, my friend. And finally, number one, bustles. All that junk inside your trunk, what are you going to do with it? 
Saving my personal favorite for last, of course, bustles were a fun little mix of everything on this list. This was also known as the Grecian Bend. It came to town in the 1870s. Now remember how we'd wear cage dresses that extended six feet and was just non-practical in any way? Well, they modified that so it was basically just your behind that was poofed out. This fabric was draped behind the butt. That was the, uh, uh, uh. The fabric was usually draped behind the butt. That was the original style, but some people got smart and began stuffing the back just to make it, you know, a little higher, a little bit bigger, a little bit more, hmm, a little more mm, to it. And then eventually you look like an absolute dump truck. So some eyes were facing you, which was a bonus back then. The bustle, looking back at it, pun intended, is ridiculous. This was not comfortable or practical at all. It began as a small piece of fabric that would hold the dress up and then it became this. Whenever I see this style, I always think of Aunt Fanny from the movie Robots. That movie is criminally underrated. I'm gonna end on that thought. Go watch Robots. <laughs> Guys, thanks for tuning in to Bumblebee. As always, I hope that you learned a little something and had a laugh while doing so. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Just from, uh, just from the, just from this 19 Ted, Ted? We need to bring these back immediately. Imagine trying to crack o what the I wrote cuckle up by accident. <laughs> Mm, mm, that's funny. The Yankee Doodle Rhyme mentions the macaroni. <laughs> that's the deepest line I ever said. Crackos. Crackos? Crackos. I'll say it four times. Crackos. Number three, the wig party. The wig party? No. But wigs were such a big deal in history that they deserve a plot. They deserve a plot. <laughs>